this here for a second. Okay, boys and girls, um, I had teased on Twitter yesterday that I wanted today's Monday Morning Analyst to be special, and, and, and I'm hoping that it is. Okay, I want to make a deal with you, okay? This is what I'd like to do today. Promise not to scream. I promise not to yell. I promise not to shout. I promise not to be <laughs> completely disparaging of people who don't share my opinion because I, I really, really want, if I can't even convince you, which I probably cannot because convincing people takes time. You can't really do it in one setting. I at least want to move the conversation in the right direction. So I'm going to make a deal with you. Let me present my arguments and then take the evidence that I am presenting to you and please, please, please review it. One of the reasons why I believe my argument that I'm about to present to you is strong and I'm going to have all the timestamps for you to go and look through from all the fights that we are going to take a look at here uh, is because I believe it's on the side of the case that I am presenting. I'm not hiding the evidence. I'm not telling you what's not out there. I'm going to tell you specifically where it is, and I'm going to ask you to take into consideration my viewpoints, but of course, in the end, make up your own. Uh, as always, the standard disclaimer, I'm not presenting this to you as the best analysis or the only analysis. I'm presenting this to you as my analysis. I encourage you to think about it in your own terms and seek out what other analysts might have to say and draw a determination from there. Okay, so what is the theme of today's MMA, well, MM analyst? I'm not going to relitigate it, but I put out a video on my personal YouTube channel trying to exonerate Mark Goddard. Because while everyone basically agrees that his way of saying to Kamaru Usman, uh, it's a fight, was totally inappropriate, and he has since apologized for that, I noticed, which is why I had that preamble at the beginning, not a lot of people who were disagreeing were looking at the clear evidence I was showing them, or they were bringing up other fights that they thought challenged the viewpoint that I was trying to make. That's one. We're going to take a look at those, video, the, uh, those uh, fights, okay? The very ones people brought up. Number two, this is really a broader debate. The broader debate is as follows. What is the proper role for a referee and a referee intervention in the middle of a professional mixed martial arts context? And contest, I should say. What am I saying? Contest. Some people make the argument that they should never be involved but for stopping a fight when uh, somebody gets viciously KO'd. There should be no separations, no stand-ups. Uh, some people believe that, that there should be heavy-handed intervention. I, I think I'm somewhere in between. But I think either position where there's constant stand-ups and constant breaks or all stand-ups should be earned, here is what I'm trying to get across to you. Those are either antiquated or extreme positions. They're not really representative of the modern reality that MMA lives in. I was talking with Danny earlier in the show that MMA has an innovation problem. Two ways. One, it's uneven across states, not, a, not in big ways, but in minute ways that can be hard to track and follow and can have an effect on the contest. And then two, there's simply not enough of the right kinds. We don't have enough innovation around what I would believe is the proper role of a referee inside of a mixed martial arts contest. So let me put up the first slide if we can. If you can't read this, don't worry, I'm gonna to get to you, or we're gonna to get to it. There's actually two slides to referee intervention. We need to have this conversation, otherwise we can't move forward. And I believe that people just have not considered these ideas fully, and I would like to try and make an argument about them. Let us make the argument about stalling and stalemates. No, no, you don't have to go to the slide, uh, people in the back. Just leave it on me. There you go. I know it's easier to read, but I'll, I'll, these are all going to be up for people to see. Stalling and stalemates are not the same thing. Stalling is a willful disengagement from activity, right? And there's going to be a lot of reasons for that. A stalemate can look like stalling, but it could just be two people who are in a position where we're not making a judgment about their pursuit of the fight. We're just saying that they just couldn't get going from there. They can look similar, they're not the same thing, although there is a little bit of overlap, okay? 
Here is where I want to start with everyone today. In order to have a conversation about this, we have to acknowledge what I would believe are some basic facts. Number one, stalling and stalemates are a problem in combat sports. You need to say it out loud. Jiu-Jitsu and the IBJJF acknowledge stalling is a problem, and they do very little about it. Okay, if you come up from 50-50, you get an advantage for a 50-50 you know, sweep or something or um, whatever. But I've seen guys flee the mat. I've seen them do all kinds of things. They do very little to enforce it. By contrast, amateur wrestling, boy, they are on that whistle constantly. Constantly they are on that whistle. Stalling is a huge thing that they regulate. They'll count shots. This uh, green wrestler has two shots. Red wrestler has 10. This guy is stalling or whatever. There's all different mechanisms. If you flee the mat, they call it. They'll raise their hand. Like, dude, they are on top of it. And it's controversial even inside wrestling. But what it does have is an impact. It forces activity all the time. You cannot tell me that you have two composite sports in jiu-jitsu and MMA, among others, and judo, by the way. Judo, if you have uh, two grips on the same side and you hold it for five seconds, penalty. If you hold someone's belt for five seconds without attempting a throw, penalty. If you uh, block their hip and stick your ass out, penalty. Dude, they, they create all kinds of mechanisms to force activity. Dude, it's a problem. It's a real problem. It's a serious problem. You have to acknowledge that's real. If you're going to take components of those sports and bring them to MMA, it is only natural you are going to end up in a position where that is a problem. Number two, there is no such thing as a real fight. Part of what people say is, I want to make sure that we don't really, um, I, don't, I don't want to interfere with the circumstances. Well, no, you don't want the referee such a player in the middle of two combatants that that, that referee has an outsized role. And how you figure that out, there's a debate to be had. But this is not a purity test. This, this is not what we're doing. People are like, well, it's more real if the referee doesn't get involved. No, it's not. In fact, a proper referee intervention accelerates action. It gets you closer to an outcome. It doesn't deter it in the wrong way. And people say, well, MMA is realer than boxing or, um, um, you know, a referee not getting involved in this capacity is more real than the other one. There's no such thing as a real fight. Every fight has a set of circumstances that make it different or that um, differentiate it from the other one. There's no base set of what a normal fight is. Does a normal fight, is it bare knuckle or not? Uh, are there multiple assailants or not? Are there weapons or not? Are there guns or not? Um, is the person injured or not? Is the contest with parity between the competitors or not? Is the person ready or not? Is it on a canvas or a brick ground or grass or not? Is it a surprise attack or not? This idea that you can find an idealized real fight is, is not real. And part of the reason people don't want a referee intervening is because they think that that interferes with a realness that is a fiction. It's not a real thing. Uh, referee intervention is necessary for a consumer product and a sport. I see this all the time. By the way, this is not a referee course. These are my ideas. I'm not teaching you something that they necessarily teach other referees. There's some overlap here, but these are my ideas. Referee intervention is necessary for a consumer product. People are always like, well, why do you want stand-up? Well, why do you want a officiant in amateur wrestling to move the action? That, that is literally part of their job. Ask any referee in amateur wrestling what part of their job is. Their job isn't to make you wrestle. Their job is to call it out when you don't. It is the competitor's job to wrestle. It is the coach's job to make that competitor wrestle. It is the, uh, the, the uh, job of the referee to know when people are failing that. Moreover, if you are going to have a spectator sport, some consideration, some consideration about action is inevitable. It is important. It matters. You want to sell tickets to something, it has to be palatable. That doesn't mean you overrun with interference it means you find a way to make sure the fight doesn't stall out. It doesn't just grind to a halt, which it will. It will. We have seen it in all the composite sports. It is important to recognize we are no less subject to some of those considerations. People are like, well, you stand up somebody and you put them back in the striking realm. How is that fair? We can debate whether that's the best choice, but we start fights on the feet. We start rounds on the feet. There is some idea about recharging action in that position as a way 
to make it a consumer product. But this is the point I'm trying to make as well, and a sport. Proper referee intervention is not the referee looking at a situation and saying to themselves, what could I do to make this more entertaining? They don't give out specific instructions. You should pass guard to the left. You should throw an uppercut. They just look for progress, or they look for action, or they look for some kind of work. This is good for the sport itself. It makes the sport more dynamic. I believe it accelerates our path in a fair way towards finding out who the better competitor is, although there are so many variables there that can be hard to know, but I generally believe that is true. This is not the referee as arbiter of entertainment. This is referee as catalyst for action when the competitors cannot be reasonably relied upon themselves to do it. Number four, uh, there we go. Not about entertainment, it's about progressing the action. These two are kind of the same. All right, well, whatever. Five, stand-ups are not necessarily the best solution, but they are simple and generally effective. I'm not, I'm not married to the idea that standing fighters up when they're stalling out is the best solution. What I object to is the idea that it's a bad one. Number one, it is effective. In the right circumstances, which is the majority of the time, you typically get a lot better action in a fight if they are stalling out on the ground and you stand them up. Not always, not every time. Sometimes there can be interference. We're gonna look at that in a bad case. But generally speaking, it more or less accomplishes what you need it to. Very rarely do you stand people up and the fight gets less ac active. Moreover, it's just a simple solution. I actually think there are better ones. I, again, I'm not married to the idea that it's the best one, but the reason we go to it is because it intuitively makes sense. If we're gonna start rounds and start fights on the feet, why not restart if there is an inability of the competitors to drive action in a particular case? By the way, not merely with stand-ups, but with stalling out um, uh, in the clinch or something like that. It works. You can say whatever you want about not liking it. Oh, it tilts it in one favor or the other. It can, it's not a perfect tool, I acknowledge, but it's pretty, pretty successful, generally speaking. Um, inconsistency among referees is not enough of a reason not to do it. I see this all the time. Oh, well, there's inconsistency in referees. This is true. There is inconsistency. Better training, I think, would make a lot of difference. Okay, fair enough. But you hear this complaint in amateur wrestling as well. You hear it in jujitsu. I don't know how often you hear it in judo or sambo, but you hear it on any time where the referee is tasked with making sure there is constant activity in any kind of um, combative contest. Look, if you're going to have two humans fight and a third human adjudicate it with them, and then that human won't be doing the next one with two different humans, and that other referee won't be doing it with those two other humans, there is going to be inconsistency. Inconsistency is not a reason to let a sport and a consumer product grind to a halt. That is not a pure way of figuring out anything. In fact, there are some further considerations to take into mind. These underpin the other ones. Number one, the referee's job. What is the referee's job? The job is to call fouls, to protect the fighters, um, to maintain order over the space, um, to be essentially the arm of the commission inside the cage. I believe it is a tragic mistake and a huge problem if you don't allow the referee not to be the arbiter of entertainment, but to be the one main, making sure there is always activity by penalizing inactivity. Now, how you want to penalize that is up to you. Should we bring back Pride's yellow and red card system? I'm a little bit apprehensive about some of the financial penalties that people could incur, but I actually think it's a pretty good idea, especially for championship bouts. I like it. I mentioned stand-ups before. I don't think stand-ups are the best case all the time. In fact, I believe Anderson Silva, when he fought Daniel Cormier at UFC 200, I believe that he was stalling. He was using the lockdown underneath. Not, this is not totally true. But virtually all attacks from the lockdown underneath require fishing for underhooks. And he never did. He stalled all the time. You should not stand those fighters up. You should penalize that fighter. Take a point. Take some money. Whatever. There are a number of ways to do this. People always ask, well, if people are stalling standing, do you put them on the ground? If that would further action in a meaningful way, I'd consider it, but probably not. So you warn them. Take a point. Show a yellow card. Show a red card. 
We can cover, come with solutions, but you have to empower the referee to not say, ooh, the crowd should be more entertained. These two competitors are no longer in a position to be trusted to further the action. I will assist them. I believe that should be a major component of the referee's job. Number two, anyone can stall. There's a big misconception about this. People think, oh, I don't want to have a stand-up because if someone gets a takedown and then the guy uh, on uh, bottom stalls and he's just looking to get up to the top, I don't want to stand him up. This is precisely my point about the person with uh, or the fight between uh, Cormier and Silva. He was doing the exact same thing. If I was a referee, I would not have stalled him. I would have started taking points. Right? And I guess, given the current rule set, then you have to stand them up. But the idea would be you could have a mechanism where that would not be in play. But anybody can stall. Top guy can stall. Bottom guy can stall. The two can stall and then stalemate together. It, it is not one or the other. When people say all stand-ups should be earned, that literally doesn't make sense. The person who might be try or who you would look to to be standing might stall. The person on top could be stalling them out so they can't or both could be stalling, in which case it, that rule wouldn't even apply. It's antiquated. Number three, stalling can be gamed. Yes, people can now, if you really enforce some kind of mechanism to further action from stalling, people will begin to accommodate that. Um, they'll have a portion of their game where they try to stall because depending on the circumstance, that could benefit them. I acknowledge that. But consider the alternative. When people say there shouldn't be stand-ups, understand when you do that, you are allowing one of the fighters in that scenario to stall and burn the clock. It's just another way of gaming the system, except in that circumstance, you have far less action. I don't see how that's a better alternative. right? Oh, I'll let you burn out the clock. I'll let you ride this position, whatever it may be, because I don't want any stand-ups. And as a consequence, it's just a different form of gaming it. At least under a, an aggressive anti-stalling enforcement, you can move the fight in a better position, in, in, in a more active way, which again is better for sport and better as a consumer product. Number four, it is impossible to rid the sport completely of stalling. It's always going to be a problem. Even with the best of rules, I acknowledge we can't fix it completely. However, in, in wrestling, dude, in wrestling, if you take like a step back, they'll call it on you. If you get pushed out onto the mats twice, they'll call it on you. And the higher the level goes, the faster they do it. Dude, they are aggressive about it, and it, it makes a dramatic impact. The idea that, I, I, and I'm not saying that we have to do everything that they do, or even half of what they do, but I hear a lot of what I would consider extreme positions where people say things like, oh man, you can't have any stand-ups because that would just be, you would be disrupting the purity of this contest. Number one, there's no such thing as a real fight. All of these are a series of conditions and incentives and contexts, and they all differ dramatically. And two, you're allowing someone else to game the system a different way. And three, there are better ways to fix this problem. Number five, sports that seriously combat stalling or stalemates have competitor cultures that prioritize activity. Look at judo. Not every judoka who makes the move to MMA fights the same way, but consider Ronda Rousey, right? She would get after it, bro, because they're on a clock and they're, they have anti-stalling rules everywhere. As I mentioned before, gripping on the same side without a throw, holding the belt, not throwing, blocking the hip and not throwing. Dude, they'll call that on you. They'll take points from you on that. They like to get right to work, man. That is judo culture in play. Think about wrestlers. Yes, as they transition to MMA, they might slow things down and set things up and things get a little bit differently. But what is wrestling fundamentally? It's a sprint. Sprint. They're getting after it. You develop an attack culture. I have a hard time understanding how that's bad for sport. I don't want people attacking to the point where they're not fighting up to the best of their abilities. Of course. That's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about alleviating the burden of the very bottom of inactivity. That's all we're talking about here. We're not talking about the high end, just the very low end where there's not enough effort being made. That's it. That's all we're talking about. And if you really take anti-stalling seriously, it can put you in a place where you can do great things and you can have a much better consumer product. Consider whatever one says about the popularity of amateur wrestling, they can fill up for the national championships in college for division one, that airs on ESPN, and they can fill an entire arena full of that. Look at the world championships, championships of jiu-jitsu. Bro, they can't even fill a community college arena with that. 
Because jujitsu has two things about it that I cannot stand. I cannot stand closeouts. That's where people who move through a bracket and meet in the finals, uh, who are from the same team, just decide not to compete with one another. I find that ridiculous and indefensible. And then two is they don't really take stalling seriously. They have some stalling rules on the books, but they don't really do much to enforce it. Well, lo and behold, guys lock up 50-50, and they just stall it out. Another one I don't like is they don't have tech falls. You can rack up 50 points on a guy, and you know, like Gordon Ryan does, and they don't call it. Um, that's my own personal pet peeve. So in judo and in wrestling, these other component sports where they take stalling seriously, you get a higher degree of activity generally. I think that matters in the long run. Now, what are the rules by which a referee should intervene? I do not have time to go through the entire rule book. These are a set of my common beliefs. These are the operating conditions under which when I view a fight, this is what I like to see. This is what I am looking for. This, I believe, is good for both combatants, it's good for the viewer at home, and it's good for the league. I believe everyone, more or less, wins under these conditions, okay? So let's take a look at a couple of them. In fact, you're going to say, well, Luke, you have nothing to say about UFC Wichita. Yes, I do. Here is Anthony Rocco Martin taking on Sergio Moraes. Look at the clock, and I'm going to, I'm going to put all these out for public consumption. They meet... At 4 o'clock, he is on top in half guard. He has uh, a guillotine grip, but a guillotine, for this to work, he would have to be on this side. So he's on the opposite side. Usually you want to get cross body to defend it. So he, there's no choke here, or, or, or very highly unlikely. It may be uncomfortable. He may not be able to free himself, but this is where he is. Four, 4 is the clock. Just watch. We've got a whole minute. No one's progressed. Whoop, whoop. Hold on, got too far. Here we go. 241, no progression. Look at this. 230, no progression. By this time, referee uh, Rob Hines is warning them to do something. No progression. Look at this. Stop for a second and consider something. In any time you're in any position like this, world champion black belt. They know what to do here. They know there's a lot of different options they have. He could fight the hands and pull his head out. He could change his base. He could try and shrimp to guard. They all know the answer. In both cases, neither are electing to do that. When someone says all stand-ups should be earned, it literally doesn't even make sense. Both guys have decided that any subsequent step from here is too risky given the other one's strengths. So they have decided, by the way, first round and they're fresh. They have mutually decided they're gonna wait for someone else to, to do that. He's gonna wait for him and he's gonna wait for him. Well, the problem is you can't really do that in any kind of a sport. This is what I mean when I have people like, intervening doesn't get us closer to the results. It gets you absolutely closer to the results. Now, you could put them in a position to recharge and restate that action. They could not be trusted after a minute and a half. When I say trusted, I'm not like saying they're bad people, but competitors find themselves here. It's not a moral judgment, it's a competition judgment. People ask me, how long should a referee wait to intervene? My rule of thumb is about 60 to 90 seconds when nobody is taking any step, literally not one, not one hand fighting from either competitor, no shrimping, from him. No attempt at posturing up, no pass, no swimming in, no switching of his base, nothing. And you want to let that go? That doesn't make any sense. That literally makes no sense. How, how do you get closer to finding out who the real competitor is there or the better fighter is there? You don't. You just burn out the clock. You're letting him game it. And I'm not saying he was gaming it. He's probably waiting on it. As soon as, Sir, as soon as Sergio, let's go. I'm going to do this, this, and this. I, I love watching Anthony Rocco Martin, but sometimes competitors get stuck. They need this guy to unstick them. Let's look at a bad case. All right? So this is, and I like referee Mario Masaki. He's a DC guy. He's moved back to Brazil, but he and his brothers are DC guys. He's come under a lot of fire. He has since recommitted himself to refereeing and getting better with best practices after that kind of disaster he had with Shevchenko and Kachuera. So I don't want to pick on Mario Masaki here, but this is illustrative. 
So this is uh, Cesar Mutanchi on top, and this is Daniel Serafian underneath. Look at the time on the clock, 2.17, okay? I'm not going to show the whole thing here. I'm going to go black here. Okay, so this goes black in just a second, and now we're back. Look at the time difference, 2.09. He's still on top. We started at 2.17. A minute later, they've kind of pushed their way to the cage. I encourage you to go back and look at this. Wasn't a ton of guard activity. Serafian tries to go deep half once. He gets stuffed. He goes for a pass once. Doesn't really work, and they kind of inch their way over here. I wouldn't call it super dynamic work, but active enough that they deserve to stay there. So nothing that has happened has been yay, but nothing that has happened uh, requires referee intervention. However, this was what I consider to be a bad example of referee intervention. Now, you can see he leans here. I don't know what Serafian was trying, but he nearly gives up the head and arm triangle here, right? This is a bad spot that Serafian is in just a little bit. So watch the time on the clock. Mutanchi is going to try and get, he's going to straight, you know, like a head and arm triangle, he's going to try and scoop this and come around. Now he has to get to this side, which he's blocked by the fence from doing. So you're going to see him rotate Serafian around, right? You're going to see this like this. And Serafian actually kind of helps him a little bit, which is a little bit weird, but okay. All right, now watch. Okay, let's take a look at this in semi-real time if I can. I don't know if I can. Okay, but just watch. Here, this is slow-mo. Watch this. He's going to push. Two. And he intervenes. I didn't like that intervention. That was not good for me. Let's go back. Here is a bad example. All right. So here... Serafian puts his rear end against the cage at 106. Mutanchi tries to step over. He needs to be over here, but sometimes you can do it from mount if you're really strong, to try and lock that up. There is no choke here. If Serafian's arm is to the mat and your feet are to the cage, by the way, which is a no-no, and you're locked in half guard, I don't know why he didn't just step out and on top, but he didn't. Meanwhile, Serafian is bridging. They are in the middle of something. They stopped moving but they are in the middle of something. He is in the middle of bridging. He is in the middle of waiting for one mistake so he can scoop that out. And it goes, they reset, three seconds. He's still bridging a little bit here. Well, maybe he's gone down now, it doesn't matter. And he intervenes seven or eight seconds. I would have let that go much longer. I would have let that go. I'm not a referee. I'm not qualified to be a referee. But when I think about good examples of referee intervention, if this is still a perilous state for the choke and he's bridging and you're in this transition moment, you got to, you know, encourage them to work through it however way they're going to. But that is an example to me of inappropriate referee intervention. And you're like, well, Luke, if you allow some, you get some bad ones. Yeah, like I said, you're not going to get always good referee intervention. This is not a good example of it. But there are also real clear, identifiable ways. If someone is working for a guard pass, you don't necessarily have to let them get the pass, but they got to always be working, always be working, always be working. They stopped here for a second because it was a transition one. Let them work through it for a second, then get in there. When they've decided that they no longer want to work, and we saw with Martin and Marais, 90 seconds where they just stayed there, well, then you can stand them up after multiple warnings. This to me was hasty. Here's one that I often hear about all the time as an example of this is why uh, you don't want to stay. Um, uh, uh, Habib did nothing. They should have stood this one up and they didn't. Connor would have been better off for it. No. This is another good example of the referee not being involved. So here they are, 408. He gets the takedown. Look at this on here. 408, okay? That is the time on the clock. Now, I can't go through this because this goes the entire round. Here's what I'll do. I'll make up something. Um, put the thumbnail back up in the studio, please. I'll jump to how about the third minute, the, the, three, the, three, the three minutes. Let's just jump there, shall we? Okay, put it up, please. Here we are at the third minute. Connor has inside butterfly and then one outside. Watch what happens. I, here he is, putting his hands on the mat because he wants to get his back to the wall. Habib trying to keep his weight down on top of him, 
and hand fight, and then sit on top. So he's tripoding in, put his weight down, and then tries to scoop him and sit him back out. Once he scoops him, he wants to turn him and put his back on the mat. Here's my point. You can put the thumbnail back up. I'm gonna keep doing this. Let's go 30 seconds in the future here. I'll go to 222. You're like, Luke, what's the point? I will show you the point. All right, I'm gonna jump 30 seconds here. Put it back up. Connor has managed to pull his legs back out and he has an overhook on one side. Let's watch what Habib tries to do. He's sitting on this left leg. He's gonna come to the side. Connor looks like he might be trying to lock up some kind of switch. He plants his hand on the mat to sit up and Habib still scooping and then wants to turn his back towards the mat. That's what he's doing as he brings his legs and swings them over, right? Because what's the worst place you can be? Flat back on the mat. That's what he's trying to do, right? Connor pushing the head away, actively resisting. Put the thumbnail up, please. Let's go 30 seconds into the future. Let's look, see where we are. Uh, let's see. Okay, go back. This is like 20 seconds, but I'll look at 30 anyway. Here he is, head pressure, leaning into Connor. Connor gets his hips scooped out. Here he is, inside butterfly on the instep. He's punching, he's trying to stand up, he gets to an elbow. He wants to have his back against the mat. Here comes Habib with Connor underhooking the whole time. Here's Habib again, sliding his knees out so he can come over again, step through, scoop them, and he wants to turn him to the cage. Connor actively resisting, posting the hand. Here's Habib sliding over. And now Connor goes for some kind of a head control on this one and gets laid flat. Put the screen up, put the thumbnail up one more time. I'm gonna keep doing this. Let's go 30 seconds into the future, shall we? You're like, oh, look, this is tedious. Yes, it is, but it makes my point for me. Let's go a minute up, put it back up. Now look where we are. He has come down, he's in half guard on top, right? So he has finally scooped enough times and turned him to get him flat on the mat. That is progression, ladies and gentlemen. And here he is on top in half guard. Here he is trying to punch Connor. By the way, if you're flat on your back, you're not really doing much. You gotta be under hooking, all right? But we don't want the guy on top to be stalling, so let's see what he does. All right, he's punching. Now he's going for the instep to help set up the pass. He is flattening one half of the hips. Connor is now framing. This is correct, right? He is doing good work here. He is framing the head away, and he might be trying to get off to the hips. Here you see Habib trying to pass. Now he switches his base. Now he can threaten head, and arm, uh, head control here and shoulder control, or he can come over the top and he can threaten the Kimura. Connor knows this, okay, because he has switched his base. This is active work, right? Put, it, uh, put the thumbnail up one more time. Let's go 30 seconds into the future. Uh, I will show you. I want to make a, I want to illustrate a point here, if I may. Okay, put it back up, please. Here we are with 10 seconds left. He has now flattened it back up, and he's got shoulder control. By the way, he's been doing good ground and pound, all right? And he is even further to getting to the mount. Look at that. He could slide that out. The round ends here. What is my point in showing you this? I don't believe that the viewpoint that I am expressing here is extreme. In fact, it would allow for something just like this. This is fine to me. In every case you have here, you don't have thunderous ground and pound. You don't have Toriando motion passing. You don't have any of that. But what you have is steady, consistent work from both guys. He's having a strategy of just draining McGregor. Because if you can drain McGregor, he's a lot, more hand he's a lot easier to handle than if he has full and complete energy. On the top, he was constantly looking to scoop, constantly looking to drag his hips, constantly learning to, to, uh, to, uh, looking to flatten him, constantly looking to pass. That's work. And the whole time for Connor, looking for underhooks, looking to get his back up against the fence, looking to get a butterfly hook, looking to stop the pass. Why would you stand that up? That's good work of referee non-intervention. Last one on this, if I may. Here is round three. I want to point something out. And this is the only thing I'm gonna show you. You can put the thing back up. Here is round three of Kamar Usman and Tyron Woodley. The time on the clock is 4.28, 4.27, and they clinch. 
This was the point I was trying to make about Mark Goddard separating here. Sometimes it calls for them to, to, to push the action, and sometimes it doesn't. In the case of Habib and Connor, plenty of action. In the case of Mutanchi and Serafian, plenty of action. In the case of Marco, uh, excuse me, um, Martin and, uh, and uh, Marais, not enough action. Here's another case where there's not enough action. Now look, he's going to bang on him with this overhook punch for a while, but this is going to go about a minute and 20, minute and 30 seconds. Look, okay, I want to point something out here. Both guys have an underhook. Both guys have an overhook. Bang, to the body. These are good. These count. Let that go, right? Let that go, right? Then he's going to do it. He just keeps going and going and going, right? These are fine. Dig them. Let them know. This is solid work here. I don't mind this, but at some point, it slows down, and now he goes back to the two-on-one, and both guys are doing it. He's throwing some knees a little bit. Not a whole lot here. Okay, let's see. Again, knee in the inside there. All right, that's something. We're looking past. Again, no more of these big punches. Kind of leans up here. All right, they're kind of walking to one side. A little more punches to the body, but now uh, Woodley's kind of covering it with his hip. All right, let's keep going here. All right, they kind of tries to lean out for a second. No, no dice. Woodley's not doing much, I grant. Uh, here we go. Some knees to the body, and he pulls them a little bit. Okay, that's something. All right. Kind of leans up back into him a little bit. All right, he's going back from that overhook punch. He's stomping a little bit. All right, and there's Mark Goddard clearly warning them to do something, which I'm going to explain in a second. They're not doing anything. A little bit pitter patter puncher, da 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 da. Just kind of hanging out. All right. Okay. And they're just going to keep going with this. Look. And then he intervenes. What did you not see there? And I made this point previously from either competitor. When Kamaru was punching early on in the clinch, that was fine. But then Woodley got wise to it. No one, not Kamaru Usman and not Tyron Woodley, no one pummeled in. No one framed and broke away. No one broke away and level changed. No one got hip to hip. These two guys, you're talking about some of the best wrestlers in MMA. They know if we're in this position, there's a place I have to do. There's, there are steps I have to take to advance this position. You mean to tell me after sitting there from, and I'll go to the timestamps here in a second. You can put the thing back up. I'm not going to show this one. It doesn't matter. Um, and they do this again, twice in the round. Hang on here. You mean to tell me that when two guys are in a neutral position, and they're no longer actively landing any kind of strike of consequence, and they're not pummeling in, and they're not fighting the hands, and they're not framing, and they're not separating, and they're not level changing. You should let that go? Why would you let that go? It doesn't put you any closer to figuring out who's better. You're letting them either advertently or inadvertently stall it out. That's not better MMA. That's less MMA. That's not more MMA. That's a worse version of it. I don't agree with that even a little bit. And then, holding on one second. All right. Just as proof to you, you can put this back up one more time. Please take a look at this. And put it back up. Please take a look at this for yourself. Look at the evidence I'm talking about. Here are the timestamps for you. Take a screenshot. In the Martin, uh, the, excuse me, the Martin Moraes fight from 4 to 225. In the Serafian Mutanchi fight. From 217 to 55, I am giving you the pieces of evidence upon which to draw your own conclusions. But I believe that this exonerates me. Two more. For Habib McGregor, from 408 to the end of the round, show me a period of inactivity that merited a stand-up. I didn't see it. And then last but not least, round one, he let it go from 139 to 50. Round three, he let it go from 426 to 322, from 240 to 124. And then in the round four was the one stand-up. 429 was the initiation of the position. He stands him up at 145. I am giving you the timestamps. I don't want to hear any critique of this that doesn't take this into account. I am showing you the evidence. Please, please listen to me. Referee interventionism is not about having them involved all the time like it is in amateur wrestling. You can see cases where the fight not, might not be that exciting and you let it go. But there are, it takes a subtle and deft hand, I recognize. 
But there are also times when two a world champion jiu-jitsu guy and a black belt and two elite wrestlers lock into each other and they need someone else to help them move. I believe that the referee is well positioned to put the, to, to move that along. All right. And that is the Monday Morning Analyst. Okay.